In 1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuler, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Schuler will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. Good morning, dear friends of Our Power. Our program is finding a broadcast. Other than original English, if the TV is the equipment that can facility, you can watch Our Power in Cantonese. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not flow open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Today, the message of Pastor Bob Shuley is generosity. He encourages us to be generous in our money, our time, our compassion and empathy. Because God says, when we give, God will give to us a hundred times more than we ever gave. God will open up heaven and pour out blessings in our lives that there is not enough room in this world to contain it. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. When we are the one who gives first, if we care for others first, more people are going to care for us. So let's live our life with open hand, because when we open the hands of our hearts to give, we are also opening our hands to heaven to receive. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is priest. Give to those in need. Give to support God's ministry. Give our time, our hearts, and our caring. Focus on what really matters in our life, other than money. If we do so, God will pour out His blessings in our lives, that there is not enough room in this world to contain it. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is priest. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not flow open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And welcome to Shepherd's Grove. We are thrilled to have you here this morning. And may you know that the sky is not your limit. Your mind is your limit. May you never stop dreaming. May you never stop setting goals for your life. Would you turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Father, we thank you so much for calling us to this place. Lord, we love you. We're trusting this day to you, and we thank you. Whatever burdens we've brought in here, we give them to you, and we thank you that your arms are strong enough to carry us through. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord found in Mark. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. 
Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Through faith, not fear, we as God's children are responding to lack with generosity. Amen. Today we have the real joy of interviewing some of our closest friends, but also two super important leaders in this church, Chad and Hillary Blake. They're both doing so much behind the scenes. Chad is our executive pastor here, but he's also like, what, tech guy, bargain hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary has, has given so much vision and does all the slides, a lot of the graphic design. Both of them really just give a lot of input into the vision of the church, and we're just so glad to have you guys. Let's give them a hand. We wanted to hear some. <laughs> I mean, you guys are our dear, dear friends, so we obviously know your journey, but um, you two have a long history with this church. How did you come to be such important leaders at Shepherd's Grove? Well, you know, each time I reflect on it, I just see God's hand uh, in it the whole time. Uh, Hillary and I were about ready to get married seven years ago, and she had just moved to Old Town Orange, and we were looking for a new church. And I was at Fuller at the time, and people were talking about this Bobby Schuler guy. Um, and so we decided to go check out his church, and it was this little, you know, this little church, and we showed up on time, and no one was there, and it was a total train wreck of a service. Uh, anything that could go wrong went wrong that day. Um, and as we walked out of the service, we looked at each other and just said, we loved it. Uh, we absolutely loved it because people were there because of community, because they loved God, because they loved each other. They weren't there for the production. And... Uh, you know, pretty soon Bobby was like, hey, why don't you come play on the worship team? And I was like, you've never heard me play. And he's like, I don't care. I'll just tell you if you're bad. I was like, okay. <laughs> so we did, uh, I, I did my internship with Bobby at Fuller, while I was at Fuller. And it was the first week of the internship that he introduced me to someone. And he said, hi, this is Chad. He's our intern slash executive pastor. And I just kind of <laughs> sat there like, huh, that's an interesting combo of two things, but okay. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we just saw the, the hand of God moving and, and the, as two churches were brought together. I went on a trip with Bobby to Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. And that's when I really caught a vision for the Hour of Power and what the Hour of Power means around the world. That was before you were working at Shepherd's Grove. As before Shepherd's Grove. It was before, you know, the merge. It was before everything. And I said, wow, this is what, an, you know, I've grown up in Orange County my whole life. So the Crystal Cathedral was always just that building you saw off Chapman. And uh, to, to see the impact that the ministry was having around the world... Uh, I caught a huge vision for it, and, you know, next things are happening, and Glenn DeMaster saying, hey, I'm keeping my chair warm for you, um, <laughs> at, you know, every, every time I pass by his office, and pretty soon I was being installed and called as the executive pastor of Shepherd's Grove. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's That's cool. Cool. And Hillary, um, I personally really admire how open you and Chad have been through these last four years of struggle to have a baby. And um, I know because we pray together every week, I've heard, you know, how intense this struggle can be. And it's, mm -hmm. it's no joke, but where are you guys right now in that process? Yeah, well, a little bit of history. Chad and I were college sweethearts, <laughs> and we have been married for seven years and we're both planners. So we had a plan going into it. We really wanted a big family someday, but we decided to wait a couple years and we actually planned this amazing trip to Europe, to Paris and Italy, mm -hmm. and we were gonna start trying on this trip. And so we just assumed it would happen right away. So we were walking along the streets in Paris and you know, we're dreaming about our future family and we were gonna tell our one day that they were made in France like we had this whole plan <laughs> and um, you know that trip came and went and months went by and it just wasn't happening and we were devastated we were shocked that it wasn't happening and 
and also just really sad. And months turned into years, and here we are four years later. Um, two years in, we decided we need to seek out some medical help, and that kicked off a full year of just like tests and procedures and trying out different things, and nothing worked. And the most frustrating thing was that there wasn't anything they found that they could fix. They just said, you're healthy, you're normal, everything looks good. And so um, about a year ago, we wound up in our um, fertility specialist's office and she just looked at us and said, you're at the end of the road. There's nothing else we can try except for IVF, which is in vitro fertilization. And we were just immediately heartbroken because it w it's super expensive and it's just a, a really long, hard process. Um, and at the time, we just didn't feel like we were ready for that. And um, so we decided to take a year to just pray about it and continue to trust the Lord. Mm. And a couple months ago, we actually decided to move forward with it and to kind of step out in faith. And so that's where we're at right now. Yeah, and I know for you guys, that was definitely talking to you that is a huge step of faith. Because being planners, you're like, we can't afford this. This is like, we got it. we're trusting God. We're gonna take a step Absolutely. and just trust God in this process. And so I really admire that, that you guys have chosen to, to step yeah. out in that way. Yeah. I know it's been like so hard too. It's, it's easy to look at you guys and like the perfect power couple, right? I mean, it's <laughs> <you> totally <laughs> look like that. And the thing else, you, you just never know what people are going through. Yeah, and God has done a work in both of our spirits. And it was, it's been a long journey. And it's also interesting trying to process these feelings individually, but then also as a couple, and just working through what that looks like. Um, but we just decided this is part of our story. This is part of our testimony. And it's not gonna be in vain. We're gonna reach out to other people who are suffering. We're gonna be vulnerable, connect deeply with others. And we're also gonna continue to be happy people it's a decision you have to make every day and some days are harder than others but um we just realized that we have so much to be grateful for and we don't know what our happy ending is going to look like but we just continue to trust and believe yeah and it's been a, a crazy journey and, and being vulnerable with people has was at first initially really hard but we've been so surprised at how many people have come up to us and said thank you for putting words to something that i didn't I wasn't able to, or I've struggled with this for 40 years in silence, or you know, whatnot. And you know, the journey for each of us is a lot different as a woman. I mean, Hillary is constantly around babies and pregnant friends and baby showers and everyone talking. And when are you gonna have a baby? You're getting, you know, you're getting old and you know, all these things. <laughs> and I mean, and for guys, I mean, we don't really, it's not, uh, infertility is not something that we talk about a lot, but I can remember one particular day that was just I was down in the dumps it was just a terrible day and I walked in the house and Hillary put scripture and quotes up on our walls all the time and I walked in it was a quote from Henry Nowen and it says you've got to choose joy and keep on choosing it mm -hmm. and I just said yes that's exactly that is that is how we've got to be as a couple that's that's what we've got to claim and you know through this journey we've we've really tried to hold on to the promises of scripture and there's one I think that uh, often gets thrown around and, and kind of misinterpreted, but Romans 8, where it says God works uh, all things to his good for those who trust him. Well, yeah. that's not saying that God causes the issue. That's saying we serve a big enough God that he takes our rubble, he takes our despair, he takes everything that we have, and, and he can make something beautiful out of it. And we Absolutely. believe that. Yeah. And, you know, that is not something to just, you know, say to something. That's a battle cry for Christians. That's yes. like, hey, we're, we're going out into this world, and this world is sometimes confusing. You don't know what's going on, but we serve a God that through it all can turn it into something good. Hey Amen. I'm so glad you guys took the opportunity. I, I just am so glad you guys took the opportunity. I feel like a lot of times you hear a testimony, I was going through this and God brought me through, but very, very often you don't hear people in the midst of going so through it. So much you're harder not to talk about it. it yet. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we think it's, I just think it's so great that for us as pastors, that we as pastors practice vulnerability instead of just preaching it. So I think yep. it's great that you guys are doing that. And I know this church is going to be praying for you. Am I right, church? In fact, let's pray for you now. Can we do that? That would yeah. be great. Well, and church, maybe you could just extend a hand like this, get a little, yeah. So Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your power 
And we pray, Lord, your blessing and your healing and your power in Jesus' name. Open up heaven. Yes, Lord. And I pray that you'd pour out on this couple everything they need. And Lord, they're asking for a child. So we pray that you would help them. I pray that this process would lead to victory. And Lord, we thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. was a child, I did childish things. My life was church and all it brings. I'd always hear the old folks sing, he's never failed me yet. I heard this phrase and I trusted so that one day I would come to know the truth in which these words do hold. He's never failed me yet. of life came test and trial and nights when tears replaced the smiles though God was right there all the while my soul was not at rest but I live to tell that I made it through instead of singing about the blues I bring this news to encourage you he's never failed me yet Laura Dickinson, thank you so much. What a joy to have you in the house today. One of the best in the business. Great. Hey, I just want to say a word about uh, television. And if you're new here, it can be off-putting sometimes with the cameras. And one thing I want to say most of all is that we care about souls, and especially souls outside of the church. And, you know, I remember the first time when I came to faith as a 16-year-old, I was the soul-winning guy that everybody was trying to avoid. You know, I, I, when I first came to true faith, I just started witnessing the people at my school, and I went to the most influential, coolest kids first, and they wanted no part of it. And then I started, then this drug dealer from the school started following me around, and he came to faith. He ended up being a chaplain in the Navy, by the way. And 
I realized that I needed to go to the rejects in my school. And a lot of the kids that were pretty rough around the edges that church people felt uncomfortable around. And I got in my heart a passion for winning souls. One pastor said, if you become a pastor before you have a heart for winning souls, you'll seek pulpits instead of souls. And that's not right. That, I want to be the kind of person that is always giving an invitation to everybody just right where they are, the opportunity to know Jesus. And love it or hate it, television is the campfire of our society. It's where we gather. It's where we get our news. It's where we get our entertainment. It's where we get updates about what's going on. It's where we tell stories. And although TV is changing rapidly, and we're already ahead of that, TV is where is one amazing way that we can reach, quite literally, millions of people every week with the gospel who otherwise wouldn't hear it. Because there is a sea of people that need to hear the gospel. And we as a church will do anything we can. We will bleed. We will, we will never stop at doing whatever we can to give every single person the opportunity to know the Lord. Amen? Amen. So thank you. <laughs> Welcome to our Power at Shepherds Grove. We're so glad you're here. And if you live in Anaheim, Orange County, LA, or you're anywhere near Disneyland, come down and worship with us. This is a community of joy. So if you've got kids, bring them. We'll teach them the things of God. We'll love to give you a big old hug and uh, come just as you are. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving from the Lord? I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. First of all, thank you for being a generous person. You may say you don't know. I know that you give a lot more than you're given credit for. And I don't just mean of your money. I mean of your time, of your heart, of your compassion, and of your empathy. And I want you to know that the axiom you cannot outgive God is true. And I want you to know that if you test God in this and try to outgive him, I promise you in this age and in the next, he will give to you a hundred times more than you ever gave. That's a promise of scripture. Generosity is the cure for lack. It's the cure for feelings of lack. It's the cure for actual lack. If you are lacking, give more. Give more of your money, give more of your time, give more of your heart, and watch and see that God won't open up heaven and pour out so much blessing on your life, there is not enough room in this world to contain it. Thank you for being so generous. I'm so proud of you. You have the kind of gift and power that surpasses monetary wealth. I mean, many of you are wealthy, some of you. Many of you are not. That's okay. All of us, if you have Christ, are wealthy in unsurpassed power to transform the world. Look, I, I want before I keep going, I want you to know, I hope you make lots of money. I hope you succeed in your business. I hope that you do better financially, but I hope you always know that anything that is good comes from God. And when you lose or when you gain, God has all the power to change everything and that the true wealth is in the power of being able to say, rise up and walk. And you have that power. Don't give it up for anything. You have the power to change the world. And that's the most important thing. There is a bit of a fickleness in money and in health. And I pray again, I hope you're wealthy and healthy and successful. But we all know that it just takes one sickness 
One lawsuit, one government policy change could wipe out all your wealth. And there is a sort of fickleness in money that we forget when we daydream about financial security. I want you to know the greatest financial security you can have is a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to know the greatest kind of health you can have is a healthy soul. And I want you to know that whatever it is you're going through, God will carry you through. And although you may be poor and, and may not have anything now, God can carry you through. And one of the greatest ways to activate your destiny in regards to whether it's finances or your profession or your family or ministry, if you want to go into ministry, one of the greatest things you can do is to lean into your loss. To lean into your lack by being generous in what you lack. If you lack money, start giving some of your money away. If you lack wisdom, start teaching. If you feel like people are not there for you and caring for you, start being there and caring for other people. I have watched over the years that the axiom from Oral Roberts, if you have a need, plant a seed, is true. And I know that there are many preachers who have taken that too far, but do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. You cannot outgive God. Jim and Susan Dawson, Susan's in the hospital, by the way. She got an infection in her back when she was here last week, and so pray for them. But when she was having her surgery, well, before I get there, these, this couple, their elders, they visit everybody. Like, when anytime anyone goes into the hospital, they're there visiting them if they barely know them. And they'll go lots of times, and they'll send cards, and they'll send gifts. And I, how many of you know Jim and Susan maybe have been touched by them? And say, oh, my gosh. I mean, it's like, okay, when Susan had her surgery two weeks ago, the waiting room was a zoo filled with people trying to get in to see Susan. Why? Why did so many people care? because they were the ones who gave first. If you care for others, in the long run, more people are gonna care for you. If you need wisdom, teach, and if you need money, give money. That is a principle, and what you are showing God is that, Lord, I trust you more than I trust this thing. Today we're talking about the famous story of the rich young ruler, in this story, there is a rich young man who sees Jesus from afar. A Jewish guy, does very well in life, successful, and he sees Jesus and he has this sense that he's missing something in his life. And he has this maybe sense of guilt or loss or insecurity even about his own salvation. And there he sees the great rabbi at a distance and the Bible says, he came to him running. Everyone say running. This is important because at the end of the text you'll see why. Remember this word. He came to Jesus running and fell on his knees. And he said, good master, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says something like, why do you call me good? There's only one above who is good. And essentially what I think he's saying is just chill out. Hold on here. So Jesus looks at him and he says, you know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud and honor your father and mother. So Jesus is giving him a hint and almost immediately this boy or teenager, I think picture him or young man, maybe in his 20s, almost immediately this guy looks up at Jesus and he says, I've kept all of those since I was a little boy. I've kept all of them. Now let me just pause real quick. Jesus was giving them a hint that everyone in the audience saw except him because of his enthusiasm. In Jesus' day, to be Jewish meant your whole life was built around Torah, around the Bible, the first five books of the Bible. Every child, unless they had some kind of a learning disability or something, would have not only read, but memorized the first five books of the Bible, that includes Leviticus, memorized. Later on, they would go into a type of schooling where they would, some of them would actually memorize the rest of the writings and the prophets. 
Others would debate it. And you have to understand that in Jesus' day, the greatest thing you could be as a Jewish man was a rabbi. The rabbis in those days were not just religious teachers, and they were. They were almost also sort of like chieftains or judges. They settled things. They were honored. They were wealthy. They did very well. And so it was like being governor or something. It was an amazing thing that could happen to you. And so many of the young boys would strive to be a rabbi. It'd be like, I, I could be like the president or something. Or being like a, on an NBA basketball team. It would have been incredible. And in those days, if you were good enough, you would go to one of a handful of famous rabbis in your community. And you'd say, I want to be a rabbi. And then the rabbi would test you with things over and over and over. And if he thought you were good enough, and usually he didn't, he would say these words, Lech hakorai. Lech hakorai. It means follow me. But they were famous, it was a famous phrase. That was, that's like your acceptance letter into Harvard. It's the dream. That is the ultimate dream to hear these words, Lech hakorai. So Jesus' whole community was built around the Bible, knowing the Bible, memorizing the Bible, debating the Bible, and the most simple thing, the first thing they learn is the Ten Commandments in order. When Jesus responds to what must I do to be saved, how many commandments does he say? Did you count them? Five. We have a slide. Here's the Ten Commandments. And everybody would have instantly, it's like ABCs in those days. His whole audience, everybody would have known these for sure. Jesus says, five through nine, and let's, let's see which ones he left out. He left out all the ones having to do with worshiping God in thou shalt not covet. There's an obvious hint that he's giving to this guy. You've obeyed me in everything except one area. There's one area. You trust your money more than you trust the Lord. He says to him, he says, do these five things. He misses the point. And he says, I've done all those things since I was a little boy. And then it says, Jesus looked upon him and loved him. I love that line. And said, one thing you lack. Sell everything you own. Give it to the poor. And then, let Hakarai. Follow me. It's powerful stuff. I wish there was a pause in the text because there, it's there. There's a dramatic pause where this young man is weighing. Should I become a rabbi and follow this rabbi? But then I'll lose everything. Or should I hang on to my business and my money and everything I have? And you know what it says? What did it say when he came to Jesus? What he was doing? Do you remember? He was running. The scripture says he walks away. He went away sad, for he had much. You realize if this young man had said, okay, I'll do it. I'll sell it all. I'll give it all to have you, Jesus. I'll give it all to follow you. I'll do it all, whatever you want. It's going to be hard, but I'll do it. If he had said that, he would have been one of the disciples. We'd know his name, like Andrew or Peter or John. We'd know his name. Maybe he would have written a book of the Bible. Maybe he would have brought the gospel to India where it never went. Who knows what he would have done? He would be an historic figure. He'd have churches named after him. Uh, instead, he's just the rich young guy that made the wrong decision. He's the one who walked away sad because he had much. He's the one who couldn't say silver and gold, have I not, but he also could not say rise up and walk. And then this dialogue continues. Jesus sort of shakes his head and in Matthew 
chapter 23, he says, he looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were, what? Amazed at his words. Why? Because in Judaism, it's a good thing to be rich. It's a great thing. You read through the Old Testament and it is all about, you know, be wise and make money. Make money! It's all over. So Jesus is sort of reteaching them that money is good if it's second. And God needs to be first. I mean, you know, you know that. But he says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, then who can be saved? Right? That's a natural question. How, mu how much is rich? And here's the point that Jesus makes. This is the ultimate point. Of course, Peter, Jesus says, with man this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then, of course, Peter, who is a very bloated ego at this time, still hasn't denied Christ three times, he says, we've left everything to follow you. Aren't we great? <laughs> Jesus just kind of ignores him and says, truly I tell you, and this is so important because this is the lesson. If you make this about giving away all your stuff to the poor, you've missed the point. Or if you make this about not being rich, you've missed the point because it's good to be rich if you have the character. He says, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much when? In this present age. Everyone say, in this present age. <laughs> Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first. Jesus tells us right there, if you give up, Everything for the sake of the gospel, you're going to get a hundred times back in this age and in the age to come. It is the classic, you cannot outgive God. It is so clear to me that the rich young ruler wanted both. He wanted to, to live a life for God, he wanted to do good things, but he wanted to like keep his portfolio sound, you know? He's a very smart guy, obviously, or else he wouldn't be wealthy. He was businessman he, he was sensible he was practical but when Jesus put it to him prove to me that you trust me more than your money he said no I'm walking away so Jesus calls us to say Lord I give you everything and watch as you give to God he is going to give you a hundred times back in a hundred ways in this age and in the age to come. Can I get an amen? amen? I want you to know, man, so many of you, I want you to know, first of all, it, is, it, it can be hard when you're generous with your money or your time or your life or your compassion, but I want you to know God will give it back a hundred times. I believe it. It is hard sometimes to preach a sermon like this. One, because this message has been abused by many preachers, but two, in particular, it's very self-serving. When you lead a ministry that requires donations. But I'm, I'm saying, not just to the church, give to your neighbor, give to your friends, help the poor, help those who are in need, and watch as you give when the Lord calls you to give. Even if you're wrong, even if it wasn't the Lord and you give with the spirit of your desire to please God, I still believe he's going to give back to you a hundred times. I just believe it. Because I've seen so many people do so many things that I thought was so stupid and you just watch how all of a sudden they're like the luckiest person in the world because they leaned into, they lean into their lack. See, the world says when you lack, then clenched fists, back up, go into defense mode. But the gospel says when you are lacking, lean into it. When you don't have much, give more. When you need somebody to help you, help others. If you need to learn, teach. Lean into it. Live the life of the open hand. Because in our spirit, when we open the hands of our heart to give, we're also opening our hands to heaven to receive. 
And, and it gives us clarity. It removes fear. It gives us crystal clear vision. We stop wasting all of his willpower on trying to protect everything. When we start to start giving, you feel rich. You feel successful. You feel like you're making a difference. There's just something good that happens to the heart and something that happens in heaven when you give. And that's, that's what the Bible teaches us. So trust him. Trust him with everything. Man, if you're, if you're wealthy, do not take this as a condemnation. I'm so glad that you're wealthy. I want every single person in this church to be super rich. If you're a good person and you have a good heart and you have character, I want you to be so filthy rich, it's crazy. And if you're a bad person, I want you to be dirt poor. I, I want good people to have money and I want bad people to have no money. But, uh, you clapped before the butt. But the good money that comes from God only comes from God when you've proved to him it's not about money. And you have. I'm so proud of you. You have put God first in your life. You've given to those in need. You've given to this ministry. You've given to others. You've given your time. You've given your hugs. You've given your empathy. You are such a, an awesome person, and I believe good things are coming. So respond in faith to the promise and the covenants of God that God responds to generosity, not to fear. God responds to faith, not to fear. Do you know why? God is the most generous being in the universe. I remember I went to this event in New York City. It was a somewhat secret event, and it was a gathering of great scientists from Harvard and MIT. And they were there as, as born again, Bible believing Christians to talk about science. We had a worship time together and I saw the head of astrophysics of one of the most prestigious scientific institutions in America raising her hands like this, worshiping God. The whole room of some of the world's greatest scientists worshiping and just praising God. And not in like a good, sensible, you know, political way, but like these were people that loved God. It was a great experience. And one of the things that happened was, I can't say her name because I don't have permission, I don't think, but she was one of the main scientists out of MIT that ran the Hubble telescope. And she just, and just loved God and loved Jesus and was showing these pictures of the universe. And it was like being in a worship experience where she's like, look at what God did here. And look at what he did here. And she had this giant screen and HD that she brought so you could really see it. And then when she talked about the scope and the grandeur of these nebulae and like all of this, it was just an incredible experience. And what she just kept saying was how generous God was, how creative he was, and, and how he just did it all just because it's beautiful, whether or not anybody ever sees it. It's just fun. It's gorgeous. And he's just going to keep pouring out of himself more beauty and more goodness. God is not going to withhold generosity from you. He's going to pour out so much blessing in your life because he loves you. He loves you. And I, I believe this. And of course, Jesus being God is so generous in it, he's just constantly meeting the needs of others. Jesus' whole ministry can be summed up into one word, generosity. His whole life, he's just giving everything. There's this one scene where he's just like healing people and preaching and teaching, and then someone's like, you need to come and heal Jairus' daughter. She's died. Can you raise her from the dead? It's like, okay, I'll go heal Jairus' daughter. And then he's, as he's on his way out the room, some other lady who has a bleeding disorder is like, oh, he's leaving. If I can just reach out and just by touching the hem of his garment, she got healed. Power went out for him. It was like everywhere he went, he was just meeting the needs of everyone to the point of giving his very blood, his perfect blood and perfect life on our behalf that we could be reconciled with the Father, he gave everything. And so did his disciples. You think giving up your wealth was a lot? The disciples gave their lives. And, and they know that in this age 
and in the age to come, you cannot outgive God. That he will always give back a hundred times whatever it is that you gave. It's only a test. That's all it is. It's a test for you. God already knows, but it's a test for you. Is my stuff the most important thing or is God? And so I want you to know, man, are you worried today? I want you to know God has seen what you've given. God has seen your generosity. I want you to let go of fear today. Let that go. Faith pleases God. God has seen how you've given, how you've blessed others, how you've helped your neighbor. And I want you to know, begin to respond with faith Begin to give, begin to desire to give, begin to bless people, bless your neighbor. You know, go, if you have a neighbors with kids or something, go babysit their kids and buy them movie tickets and give them 50 bucks for dinner. You know, like <laughs> if you see someone and they don't know how you're gonna pay their rent, pay their rent for them. Give and watch that God won't just pour out so much blessing on your life. There won't be enough room to contain it. If you don't have money, give what you can. I, I remember one pastor. Before he was a pastor, he was a young man. He had lost everything. All he had was the clothes on his back and a pencil. And he loved his pencil because it was all he had left to write on cocktail napkins when he wrote ideas for books and things. And he was in church and he heard a sermon about leaning into your lack. And he put that pencil into an envelope. And he he said, and it was the next day, all of heaven opened up in my life. It was so hard, you think like a pencil, it was so hard for him to take this pencil and put it in an envelope, but he just, he said, I'm I'm even giving up my pencil, I'm giving it to you, God. This is a principle that has gone out of fashion. It doesn't matter, it remains true. You cannot outgive God. It's more blessed to give than to receive. When you give, you feel successful. When you give, opportunity comes to you. I've met so many wealthy people who have done so well in business, and you ask them, and they're like, you know, I was just at the right place at the right time, and I met the right person, and I just took a hold of that opportunity, and nothing was ever the same again. There is something about opportunity, and I think opportunity comes for us when we give, very often. The most important reason you should be a generous person is because God is so generous, and you are a generous person, and what that does is that it keeps you aligned to what really matters that people matter, that heaven matters. You're going to have to say goodbye to it all someday. And when you get to heaven, you might wish you would have given more and lived by faith more. You won't. You won't because you are living by faith. You are generous. You are loving. I'm so proud of you. And I think I just want to say thank you. And I want to promise you that God is going to pour out a hundred times more than you've given. He's just going to pour it out on your life. And I want you to leave here with a sense of hope that you're going to receive good this week from the Lord. And you will. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. Thanks for watching our power and your support to us. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not flow open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Today, the message of Pastor Bobby Shirley is generosity. He encourages us to be generous in our money, our time, our compassion and empathy. Because God says, when we give, God will give to us a hundred times more than we ever gave. God will open up heaven and pour out blessings in our lives that there is not enough room in this world to contain it. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. 
when we are the one who gives first, if we care for others first, more people are going to care for us. So let's live our life with open hand, because when we open the hands of our hearts to give, we are also opening our hands to heaven to receive. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 16, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is priest. Give to those in need. Give to support God's ministry. Give our time, our hearts and our caring. Focus on what really matters in our life, other than money. If we do so, God will pour out His blessings in our lives, that there is not enough room in this world to contain it. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is priest. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not flow open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Our part this motivational TV program is broadcast weekly on TV People channel. Every Saturday at 10 a.m. in the morning and every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And you can also watch online simultaneously on www hourofpower.org or my TV Super. God loves you and see you next week on TV Pearl.